former New Jersey resident, returns home as president of Colwell University. Meet him next on the Giblin Report. Welcome to the Giblin Report. I'm Assemblyman Tom Giblin, representing the 34th Legislative District, which includes Clifton, East Orange, Montclair, and Orange. On today's show, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Matthew Whalen. Welcome, Dr. Whalen, to the Giblin Report. Thank you for having me. Doctor, you're the newly uh, installed uh, president of uh, Colwell College. Correct. First of all, now, excuse me, Colwell University. Correct. I'm dating myself, but uh, Colwell University, maybe first of all, tell us a little bit about that. So it was, it's an interesting start to a year. I signed to come on about uh, three weeks before the pandemic hit, and uh, I was coming from a large university in New York, but I thought Caldwell University had all of the assets and all of the mission-driven um, focus that we need in today's higher education society. So uh, in spite of the pandemic, I stayed with it on July 1st. I started with the uh, sisters and the, and the good folks at Caldwell University, um, and we were right into the middle of this pandemic dealing with everything we had to deal with. So it's been an interesting start. Now, where's the uh, university located and you know, approximately how many students are enrolled there? We are um, in Caldwell, New Jersey, right off Bloomfield Avenue, 120 Bloomfield Avenue in Caldwell, New Jersey, just as you pull out of Verona in Caldwell. And uh, we have about 2,200 students, 1,700 or so graduates, another 500, uh, excuse me, 17 or 1,700 undergraduates, about 500 graduates in, in uh, an array of programs that range from business to art therapy to esports management. And I know the university's going to be observing a big anniversary uh, pretty soon. I think it was founded in... 1939? Correct, 1939. So we're headed towards our centennial. Okay. Uh, you know, about your background, what, what university were you affiliated with before you moved to Caldwell? I was with Stony Brook University, a large uh, public university, part of the SUNY system, the jewel of the SUNY system. Um, I'll get letters about saying that, but um, really a phenomenal uh, AAU, one of the top, recognized as one of the top research universities in North America by the Association of American Universities. Um, very, very focused on, on, on the STEM disciplines, um, but also has a phenomenal English program. Uh, a large school, 27,000, uh, with about 16,000 undergraduates, I think, is a split. You're, you're making full circle. Uh, it was stated uh, in your bio that you're a Jersey native, so you've kind of made the turn back towards home. What, you know, uh, so how do you feel about that? Well, it's, um, as I said to a few people, it's easier to get a Taylor ham sandwich. So, um, Where were you born? I was born and raised in Denville. I was born and raised in Denville, New Jersey, a family of uh, 10, eight children, two parents, a traditional uh, good old Irish Catholic family. Uh, went to St. Mary's School in Denville, um, Mars Catholic High School in Denville, and then uh, went to Mercyhurst College, now a university in Erie, Pennsylvania, right on the shores of Lake Erie. And that was a small... Uh, mission-driven Catholic schools just the same as Caldwell University is. That was run by the Sisters of Mercy, but I found my niche there and I found that those institutions provide both an education and a, a, a tradition of service and giving back that I think is very important in uh, society today. And so that's what I wanted to do as I, as I go into the uh, probably twilight of my career here. Uh, I wanted to make sure I was at an institution that was giving back in a special way. How are you doing with enrollment at Colwell University? You know, your, your numbers staying pretty consistent or is there a challenge as far as trying to get new students? Certainly challenges, but last year we had our second highest enrollment in the history of the university in terms of new, new uh, freshmen coming in um, and new retention for our, for our current students. 
Uh, and, and that was in spite of the fact that we could not bring in about 40 undergraduate international students who were stranded in their home countries either because of consular closures or, or they could not get flights into the United States. So we, we likely would have had our highest enrollment last year and Caldwell is on a, a wonderful trajectory of, of attracting students and keeping students and providing them with that uh, Dominican education, service driven education um, where we teach you know the mission of Caldwell to pursue truth and seek justice I can't think of a better mission in today's day and age. The issue of uh, students uh, you know, going forth, is that going to be still a challenge? It'll be a challenge uh, for sure. Moody's put out uh, some ratings today that show there's incredible challenges for both public universities and, and private universities. Part of that is driven by pure demographics as we come into, as we come at the end of a very a fairly good growth period and we start to go into a, a decline in the, in the raw numbers of high school graduates. So that will be a challenge over the next few years. And what about the issue of the foreign students? Uh, is that something to do with immigration policies on a national level? Internet, everything has been impacted by COVID, but certainly um, the United States, due to some of its policies, are becoming less attractive for students, uh, even in terms of the optional practical training that they're limited now in, in, in getting. Um, some of the current policies that are coming out of Washington are, are concerning for students. So they may opt to go to other countries that are a little more friendly towards bringing international students in. You know, uh, with these challenges that you're facing, you know, what, what needs to be your mindset, you know, going forth to really make Corbell University a viable uh, educational institution? So I, I, tell, I tell our staff, no matter who they are, faculty, staff, administrators, myself, uh, my wife, every one of these students is an individual. And so we are not dealing with 2,200 students. We're dealing with one student 2,200 times. And so each student has their own set of uh, concerns, of abilities, of talents, uh, of direction. And so we need to work with those students as individuals to ensure that we're providing them within Caldwell's mission the best possible education. Uh, I read some notes that were submitted by your office about Caldwell graduates being on the front line of this uh, pandemic. Uh, what is that? What does that mean? Uh, so we have students who are um, doing research. Uh, we have students at both um, Columbia. We have students at Johns Hopkins. Um, we have uh, nurses that are on the front lines dealing with COVID every day. And as they got through that first wave, I am sure they are right back there um, dealing with it again. In addition to that, we are training a whole new uh, group of nurses to go out into the field. And as, as they uh, prepare for their training at Caldwell, they are already intimately familiar with the infection control, the PPE, all of the things that they need to do on campus. And they'll carry with that with them into the hospitals, you know, plus some. So our students are, uh, nursing is still one of our most popular majors. The COVID uh, issue has not scared them off. And that is, I think, purely because these students have a deep commitment to giving back. Uh, in doing some research about Coal University, I noticed that you're a Hispanic serving institution. Correct. Tell us, tell us what that all means. So we, we have about a third of our students are Hispanic. And so the U.S. Department of Education has recognized us as a Hispanic serving institution which means that we have a have a large number of Hispanic students. And what accounts for that? I think it is uh, partially demographic shifts in and around um, our recruitment areas, Essex County, Bergen County, Hudson County, um, even parts of Morris County and, and, and getting into Passaic and, and Monmouth. Um, we recruit about 83 percent of our students are from New Jersey. Um, so within our catchment basin, within what our primary recruitment areas, there are a number of uh, Hispanic families who are seeking the best for their students. Very often those students like to stay close to home if they're first generation students and Caldwell is an attractive destination for them. So that accounts for this being one of the largest freshman classes uh, the university has enjoyed? Partially, you know, partially accounts for it. But again, it was been all all of our um, recruitment uh, assets are out there recruiting students, no matter who they are, no matter where they're from, race, creed, color. Um, we're looking for students who are committed to service, to learning, to the Dominican traditions, 
of, of going out and serving others in, in uh, uh, sometimes prayer and contemplation as well. So I assume there are a number of Hispanics eventually going to move into uh, professorships or spots in the administration and it kind of goes in parallel? Absolutely. My, one of my recruitment and uh, one of my personal goals and, and one of the board goals, I should say, is to diversify both our board uh, and for me to work on diversifying our administration, faculty, and staff. And, and sometimes students want to go where they see people who have either look like them or talk like them or have experienced some of the same things that they've experienced in their life. So it's an important part of who we are is to make sure that we reflect the diversity of the community. And so that will be a, that will be a goal to increase, increase uh, minority students, students who are underrepresented in higher education. And it's a focus, I think, of every higher education institution. It's how we provide social mobility. So, for example, you know, getting a diploma from Colwell University, what kind of uh, strengths or stature does that bring to a graduate? Well, you know, I think it all depends on, on um, our connections. And we have, our connections are quite good. Our, our Applied Behavior Analysis Program, we're one of just a handful of programs accredited in the country. Those people go on to serve students and families with, with autism and dealing with those learners in a special way and attending to their special needs. And that's definitely on the rise. It's an emerging problem and we need professionals to deal with it. And we have uh, one of the top programs in the nation, I will say, in doing that. Uh, we have a clinic on campus where we actually serve families and student learners um, to ensure that they can get from their, from their, from their life as much as their, their uh, um, issues allow them. And we work with them to ensure that they're getting the most out of their life. Yeah. Athletics uh, up at the university, I mean, you know, as part of having a, a well-rounded college experience. Sure. So how, how are you all doing in that area? We had some wonderful recruitment. Um, I'm hearing we had wonderful recruitment uh, last year. Unfortunately, I haven't seen a game or a practice yet. Uh, ath athletics is sort of on hold. Shut down, yeah. Everything's on hold. So we have a sprint football team. I heard that a few years ago we took our sprint football team, which is basically students. I believe the cut weight cut off is 185 pounds. Uh, but other, other than that, it's, uh, it's football. Uh, they went down to Navy and got walloped about 72 to nothing. Last year, I understand they came back and we gave them a close game right here at James Caldwell High School. Well, that's uh, part of the uh, attraction as far as, uh, you know, any university is concerned. How are you doing with uh, private funding in terms of support from either alumni or corporations uh, throughout the state? Uh, are you meeting your goals? Uh, we're, we're, we're increasing our goals. And that some people would think that's um, probably um, counterintuitive to do in a, in, a, in a downward economy, but our, our alumni are so committed to our institution that we know that they will, they will um, dig deep into their hearts, minds, and souls and their pockets to help us. And so we have put a actually challenge out to raise $1 million in four months. That's never before been done at Caldwell. That would be a uh, tremendous asset. That money would go to scholarships to help students stay in school because we know our students and their families, we know their parents will be affected by the economy. They'll be losing jobs. And so we're doing everything we can to help them. Um, foundations, grants, we received a few national grants last year. Um, and we are working with everyone. And our corporate recruitment is about to step up as I come on board. And so I will be out meeting people and talking to with them. A and it's not just about money. They have the talent in their organizations that can take in our, our, our interns. They can come and lecture in our classes. So um, it really is relationship building, not for the short term and not for a quick donation, but for the long term uh, for that company, because we will support that company someday, just as our, they're supporting us now. So most of your students, I assume, are from New Jersey. I mean, you get many foreign students, and then the other side of the coin, once they graduate, do they have a tendency to stay in the state? Most of our students, uh, the, the overall um, data would show that students will get their jobs in the state of the university they attended. Um, and, and in New Jersey, one of our... So that's why it's important to have that rapport with the business community. Absolutely. And we work with the uh, Newark Regional Business Partnership. We're in, we're in other chambers. And we, we want to get out and show these communities that just as our, our faculty, our alumni, our students uh, support them, 
we would like them to support us in the learning process and in donations of, we've received a wonderful donation of 40, com, of, excuse me, 20 computers from LG. Um, and that is a cost offset for us that is quite appreciated. And so that type of relationship, but also putting our interns there, having their senior executives come and talk to our MBA students or our business students, that's the type of relationship that we're looking for. So among you're getting the job placement you'd like or opportunities for the graduates? Yeah, I haven't seen the report come back this year, but last year we did very well. The, the, the initial report I saw showed that 98% of our students are either employed uh, or in graduate school. So I'm, I'm fairly happy with that. I told you, you you're going to have or ha will have uh, two commencements in a very short period of time. You, you had to move the traditional May commencement back to the fall this right. year. So how did that all work out? So we actually held three ceremonies. Three. We, three. We held a doctoral ceremony early in the morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, several hundred people attended that for our doctoral students. Uh, we held it outside on a soccer field with everyone socially distant. Um, and we were able to present these students with a diploma, um, wearing our masks, of course, in our robes. But they got to, to, to the feeling that a first-generation family gets. And I know this as a first-generation student. When, when their student, when their son or daughter walks across that stage and is, is handed a diploma, it, it, it's, it, it's unexplainable. It's very, very meaningful. What did you say? You came from a family of nine, is that right? Ten. 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 Sorry, one off. That's a lot of education. Were your parents able to scrape it all together and make it happen? So uh, my parents worked as hard as they could to keep the family uh, sustained and we all went off to, to college, Notre Dame, Villanova, Mercyhurst, Scranton, University of Dayton, other, you know, other schools, Quinnipiac up in Connecticut, and W&J, Washington, and Jefferson. Um, we did a lot by ourselves. We worked. We worked in dish rooms. We painted. We did just about whatever it took to earn the money to, to pay whatever our financial aid didn't cover. Now, the government helped us, and we were deeply appreciative. But if you look at the, the, the tax rates and the repayments of my family's taxes right now, it far exceeds the amount of money we got from governments to attend school. And so the government funding of higher education, whether it's from the federal government or the state, it works because it pays back um, down the road. Down the road, there's going to be challenges uh, for institutions of higher learning. Yes. <coughs> uh, I'm told there's a shrinking base yep. of potential students. Are you going to have to try to appeal to uh, more uh, senior students or uh, people who are doing it on a part-time basis, you know, to fill the gap as far as uh, filling the classrooms and, you know, meeting the needs of the community. Well, what do you see as some of the real uh, challenges that you're, you have to face uh, in the future? That's a very astute question um, because that's exactly what we're facing in all those areas. And we have to meet students where they are. If a student wants to be in our classroom, we have to be there to help that student. If a student wants to learn online, we have to be there to help our student. If a student wants to learn in their corporate conference room, we have to be able to go there. So I'm working with the staff and the faculty right now at Caldwell to be sure that they understand that, that the educational environment is changing, and it's very important for us to deliver the programs they want in the manner they want at the times they want. Um, and I think all colleges are trying to do that right now. Is the jury still out about the difference between, you know, the in-house learning versus the virtual about, you know, the long range impact of how they're getting the uh, instruction across? So the long range impact, I think, is, is, is as of yet unknown at, at Caldwell anyway. There may be other institutions that have been doing it longer that have a little more data, but we're assessing it. All of our assessment is required by middle states, but more than that, it's required to make our programs better. We need to understand, are we doing, are we accomplishing what we say we're doing? And assessment tells us that. I think the uh, Commissioner of Education or Secretary of Education is kind of being directed to kind of doing an analysis of that, of educational uh, institutions across the state to just see how successful or what needs to be honed up uh, as far as that area is concerned? 
I understand we have a new Secretary of Higher Education in New Jersey, just named, I believe, yesterday or last night, and so I will follow up on that. And, but I'm sure that is a direction, and that's a good direction to follow, provided that um, success is measured in more than just employment and jobs. There are people um, who attend college, or uh, some of our more senior people are attending courses and classes because they just want to finish something they started maybe 40 years ago. So success and, and uh, how, how we define success as a, as a society I think is very, very important. But we are, we're working on understanding that and we believe our, our, the outcome of a Caldwell education thus far has proven to be very valuable. Caldwell College was founded by the Dominican Sisters of Caldwell you know, uh, back in 1939 and of course as we all know uh, calls to the religious way of life are diminished substantially. So that has meant less presence on campus, but uh, the flip side of that is that uh, it's meant increased costs for professors and other types of uh, lay instruction. So uh, you see any change as far as, you know, the ultimate product as far as the student is concerned with the lessening of religious presence on the campus? I don't think so. I think while the, while the presence and the visible presence um, with, with the nuns in traditional habits um, and, and robes may be gone, the nuns, our sisters are still on campus. One of our sisters is the vice president for student life. Uh, another of our sisters works in our, in our um, uh, assessment and, and care center, the, the, the student tutoring center. So they are present on campus. More than that, they're right across the street. But more than that, we have created this mantra, our core values of respect, integrity, community, and excellence. And they merge very well with the sisters' uh, traditions. And we want, that's what we want our students to engage, respect, integrity, community, and excellence. And take that with them, not just while they're at Caldwell and embed that in their life at Caldwell, but take that with them when they leave Caldwell. That's where we make a difference. You know, the issue of student housing, you know, with dorms, uh, yeah. that's a challenge, you know, in terms of, for health reasons, you know, dealing with COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, has Caldwell University worked with that issue? We have. We have de-densified, I guess is the word we're using right now, our, our residence halls. So we have about 50% occupancy. Um, we have brought uh, students back almost all of them into single rooms unless they want to be with a, with a brother, sister, friend. Um, and so we have about 310 students on campus at, when, I, when we started here in the fall. Um, there may have been slight changes to that as we've gone through the last, the last few weeks. Uh, we can actually bring somewhere around 625 students to our campus in the residence halls. So we have about 50% occupancy. And that allowed us to really de-densify, to do some cleaning, um, that, that would be easier with, with less people in those dormitories. Um, and we are also asking our students to take their materials home with them, all of their belongings home with them. When they leave in, in before Thanksgiving, they'll finish the term online and we will do very deep cleanings of every space in those residence halls. You know, Dr. Matthew Whalen, uh, financially, how is the university doing? I, you know, I read a lot of different articles about especially the larger uh, educational institutions are really under uh, a lot of strong financial pressure. You know, they had to make uh, refunds uh, as far as, you know, the housing was concerned and a lot of other uh, give backs to the students and, and things like that. So, and of course, they relied a little bit on some type of support, you know, with the uh, CARES Act and things like that. Is this left a, a big hole financially with some of the challenges you faced uh, during 2020? It certainly left a hole at not just at Caldwell, but at institutions all over the United States. I'm on a call this afternoon with all of the Catholic University presidents, Catholic College University presidents across the country. And so all of us are facing with the, the either loss of revenue because of tuition uh, revenue loss, auxiliary revenue loss, and how we use our dormitories and residence halls for camps in the summertime. All of that revenue has been lost. Our residence hall revenue has been lost, and yet we still have to pay for heating and, and some electric in those residence halls. So yes, there's a, there's a challenge. Uh, Caldwell's DO, DOE score, the Department of Education, 
pr has a score that they calculate for us is still in a, a very good range, a safe range. And so we will watch that very carefully and make sure that we're doing everything we have to do. Uh, it will take some support. Recently, New Jersey uh, provided $150 million to higher education institutions in the state. That doesn't sound like a lot when you spread it all out, though. Well, right? here's, the, here's, the dis here's the problem. It, it, it isn't. I know it, it's a big number, but when you... $149 million went to the public institutions. 14 private and independent institutions had to share $1 million. So the disproportionality of that was stunning, quite yeah. stunning. So we're, we're, we're asking for help again. Um, we have to do, we have to engage the same costs, the same barrier control, the same protections. We're suffering the same revenue loss as our colleagues and our friends in the public sector. The public sector also needs this money. But there's got to be a more uh, recognition that we serve somewhere around, I think it's between 15 and 18 percent of the state's population. They need help too. Well, the Giblin Report is an honor to have Dr. Matthew Whalen, uh, the newly inaugurated president of Colwell University. Uh, if any of our viewers want to find additional information about uh, Colwell University, what's the best way to do it, doctor? www.caldwell.edu. We update our, our pages as uh, almost every day. We update our COVID information. We're updating our classes. We're in the midst of redoing our website to make it a little more user-friendly. Um, and so that's the place to start. And if they can't do that, they, they just call my office at 618-3518. Uh, and that will, help, uh, that will help get the number, the name out. Thank you, uh, Dr. Matthew Whalen. Uh, Coal University is a jewel right in our own backyard right here, especially in northern New Jersey. And keep up the good work and uh, much success uh, during your watch. Uh, as the president. I want to remind our viewers that if you have any pressing issues that require my attention or issues regarding star cur current state legislation, you can contact me at my office, 973-779-3125, or else you can email me at asmgiblin at njleg.org. For additional information, you can also go to my website at www assemblymangiblin.com. Thanks for watching the Giblin Report. And remember, if it's an issue to you, it's an issue to me.